playing. But hey, look at our uh, opponents for our next set here. Um, Oh, we got EB Nugiri. Yeah. They are um, a low-level pickup. I believe they are comprised. Uh, Fishy Fash is on this roster. Uh, I believe, no, not Starbit is not on this roster. I believe she was considered at one point, but I don't quite remember. <laughs> I believe, I believe they're still oh, on Oh, here we there. go. Yeah. I found it. Echo, Fishy Fash, Riley. Riley is from Aquatic Vanguard. Starbit and Tux. Tux is formerly from Thembo IHOP, a Div 4 team from last Looty season. And I believe they play on Prism now, or I might be mistaking that for another player. And then last ditch effort. Again, like teams that have a lot of results or individual or team results, but maybe don't really play as a as a team. Last ditch effort V2, <laughs> as we can tell, has uh, Doodlen, Ramen, Kez, and I don't know who their sub is. Um, for one of their members who couldn't be here. But, um, yeah, it's uh, teams that have results and, um, you know, very good uh, very, very good solo results as well. Right, having these players with these individual self-results add a very interesting dynamic to these pickup land environments because now that you're in person, you can kind of synergize with them in a way and kind of go off of what they're saying in person, what they're actually feeling and then emoting. So I think that, you know, like what they bring to the table individually can come together and create something that's awesome, which is super cool and something totally different that you don't see anywhere else. That's right. And these teams are warming up now and getting situated here. Again, uh, when there's a lot that's actually involved with these lanes when you move from station to station two, because um, a lot of audio things that can happen, um, you know, we're a little a little behind schedule on our stream, but, uh, you know, it's uh, it, our, our staff, once again, is doing such a great job <laughs> managing everybody. And um, I, some of these players, again, first time playing on stage, it is it is literally like the stage, you know, when we say on stream and a, a physical stage that they're playing on. But uh, just a lot that goes on to go from station to station to make sure that everything is adequate, make sure they can hear the game audio, they can hear everybody who's talking, because it's it's a very involved setup. Right, exactly. I think this is also a very new technical environment to introduce people to. I, land experiences are very often hard to, to get due to lack of accessibility. Um, they're not put on very often, especially due to the ongoing pandemic that we've been experiencing. But now that we're able to do these things as a community, people are able to start adapting to this kind of new technical environment, which is incredibly interesting as coming from someone who's done multiple lands before, where, you know, you could just help someone out because they're trying to learn just like yeah. how you were learning, you know, just a few years ago. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, for my teammates, um, this was this is their first land for all of them. One of them was at Shine, so that was their first land. But this, for everybody else, is their first land. And I think getting to experience that with them is is all a part of the joy. And um, again, it's it's just so much fun. Right. And now that we're entering into the second round here, let's take a look at the maps again because we are also introduced back to to each map is from a different game actually now i'm looking at it yeah yeah so it, we're starting off with clam blitz mince meat metalworks that is a tongue twister <laughs> that is one of the new maps for splatoon 3 and then like you said falco we got an unfamiliar one for some folks mahi mahi resort for round for game two on splat zones yeah i mean clam blitz on mince meat i've i've had a lot of fun with that one uh that that map in particular um i feel like it it's um it's <laughs> it's it, yeah it's it's different obviously i feel like i'm like talking in circles you know and right. everything but it's um it's so much fun where you can um you know i actually just lost track of what i was saying <laughs> Well, here, how about how about the map layout, though? Yeah. Because this is as a new map. I remember playing this on the Splatfest, and I was just yeah. so fascinated because of how linear it is. Yeah, yeah. Like, a lot of these maps have such different layouts from each mm -hmm. other. They could be either very linear yeah. or very wide. Yeah. And that's I think that's something that players have to kind of adjust to because we're yeah. used to really different and weird, yeah. awkward map layouts and from Splatoon 2. Yeah, and overall, I feel like they 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 feel a little more condensed too. Mm -hmm. And I think in especially a mode like Clam Blitz where you don't have as much clam economy, it's going to make the map feel even smaller too, when um you know everything is kind of consolidated just a little bit more. Right, exactly. And speaking of the clam economy, I'm sure this has been pointed out many a time, but I can't help but emphasize again the requirement to build the clam ball 
has reduced from 10 to 8. Yeah. That is a game changer in so many facets. Um, managing this clam economy is going to, and the amount of clams each team is going to have to hold on to mm -hmm. to, you know, make a push for objective. Yeah. And keeping track of everything, and not to mention building the ball to actually initiate a push. That is going to have to have a lot of players rethink their strategy. Yeah, and even from a defensive perspective, if you see somebody who has seven clams, you're going to think, oh, they still need to get a few more. But no, they just need one more to get that power clam. So you have to kind of take both uh, both approaches and look and see what you need to do depending on what type of position that you are in. Right, exactly. Now, let's take a look at Mahi Mahi Resort real quick because this is, this is again, a Splatoon 1 map. So something that we have not seen in many, many years at this point. And players are going to have to be reintroduced to the fact the water level changes yeah. of the map. So the whole map level shrink, not shrink, excuse me, sinks further down mm -hmm. to reveal more turf to cover and claim. Yeah, it's um, a unique hazard that is in this game, too. And it really opens the door for a team, maybe if you're down. It, it, you know, it can kind of go both ways. It can enhance the lead of the winner or give the uh, losing team an opportunity to try and get more turf to ink mm -hmm. or to paint. So that, that one is a fun one, and I'm glad that one's back in Splatoon 3. Right, exactly. And I think that's going to be a very interesting one to keep an eye on because this is zone specifically. The whole objective is to paint a specific patch of turf. Yeah. So now when you expand the layout, you have more opportunities to attack the zone yeah. and approach it from another angle. So like you've pointed out earlier, offensively and defensively, these teams are going to figure out different strategies on how to approach the water level drop. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's a, it's a fun stage too. It looks really pretty. You know, that's that's, that's you one know of those what? things where um, when I played it in Splatoon one after Splatoon two came, out, I'm like, oh, this is a good stage. I'd like to see it again, and now it's here. So yeah, it's just really that. good vibes. Yeah, good vibes only here. <laughs> the aesthetics, the jellyfish in the background. I'm very particular. That reminds me of Albacore Hotel from Splatoon two. With yeah, like the jellyfish are just dancing yeah, just and hanging out. waving in the background. Yeah. it's adorable. Yeah. And um, if we do get to see a game three, that, of course, will be Tower Control Wahoo World, a stage that we all know some may love, some may don't. Um, honestly, with a lot of the maps that are brought back into Splatoon 3, I was very satisfied with all of them. I agree, personally. I think it's a healthy mix of fairly balanced and strong maps, at least that the competitive community favors. Uh, I'm assuming the casual community also has similar sentiments as well. Can't speak on that, but I know overall, competitively, a lot of players are very pleased with some of these returning maps. Um, Sturgeon, Shipyard, Mako Mart. Mm -hmm. Those are very um, frequent map mode combos that show up in competitive environments and in lands. So I'm sure players are going to be pleased to seek something a little bit more familiar to kind of return to at some point. Yeah, and it's good that we are, I mean, there are only 12 maps that we can choose uh, right now. Mm -hmm. And the, these are the nine that are chosen. So uh, Sturgeon being the other one that is coming, uh, that, will be in, uh, that will be in round three later on today. Right, and something interesting I want to point out about Wahoo World is that the tower path has changed. So we, in Splatoon 2, we have seen a tower path go over to the left ramp and then drop down and sit at the bottom of the map. Now the path takes a totally different route than before. So sure, it's a familiar map that Splatoon 2 players will enjoy, but they're gonna have to reconsider a whole new path change. It's something so simple. It's gonna kind of revolutionize how they're gonna have to think, strategize how they're gonna initiate their initial push. Right, and you know, if you have a backliner who likes to stay on a specific part of the map because that's mm -hmm. easy for them to approach the tower, there's gonna be a different spot that you have to find just based on the positioning of it. So even though we have new maps, we have different play styles. And I think too, especially when you throw Rainmaker in the mix too, mm -hmm. like Sturgeon Shipyard, you know, we know Sturgeon by heart, mm -hmm. but we are not used to being uh, being told that we have to go to a certain podium first before we try to get the knockout. Right, we're being commanded to go do this and go do that. We're like, no, we're not used to that. We're used to going our own way however we want to. Yeah. Now we're being told how to do so? Come on, Nintendo. <laughs> now, how do you feel about most of the maps having, or all the maps having two potential uh, midpoints to bring the Raymaker? That, I personally think it was a very strong decision overall to implement this new game, this game changer. I primarily because it helps improve the pace of the game. I think a lot of players are used to the cliche, oh, Rainmaker 100 to zero knockout right mm -hmm. there. However, I think it helps 
allow a moment of pause in the pacing of the game, allows the defensive players to reset, to kind of come back together and regroup and resync. So it makes for a lot more interesting game. Not yeah. only that, it also allows the, the pushing team a chance to also kind of prove themselves in a way, right? Like, are they able to truly sustain a push? Yeah. Or are they just going for show here? Yeah, it breaks up the game and um, it kind of prevents those spirals that we can see in Rainmaker because Rainmaker is one of those modes. If you get wiped, it is hard to recover from, mm -hmm. and um, especially on certain maps. So this, again, kind of breaks it up, makes it, it's like, it's, it's a reset, it's a regroup. Okay, we're gonna, we have to dunk it, we have to pop it again before we pick it up mm -hmm. and then uh, try and make another push. But I think it's a very welcoming change in Splatoon 3. Right, exactly. And I think a lot of the competitive scene overall kind of views that similarly. Um, I'm sure people like would want to have that 0 to 100 push, kind of that knockout, because it's so satisfying. And it also shows the momentum that a team can carry. But I think it definitely makes for also a much more interesting game to watch as a viewer and, yeah. and to commentate as well. And a little uh, fourth wall breaking there. But I mean, I, I think the pace, it just, again, the pacing is just a lot better in this game overall. Yeah, and because it's brand new, we're kind of seeing things of, okay, what will work, what won't work, and especially seeing very high-level competitive play that even higher that we'll see in the top four later tonight, how they approach this and how they go about getting their knockouts. Right, exactly. So it looks like we are gearing up here. Some players are in the training room now, I'm observing. Now, one of the improvements that I think a lot of players are absolutely overjoyed by, the warm-up station. Oh my goodness! The yes. warm-ups. I th I think I've I have not heard a bad thing about it. No. Honestly. No. The fact that you can be with your teammates, number one, or like people you uh -huh. want to be with, and you know that it's not very practical, but it's fun, and um, it, it's just a bigger practice room. Mm -hmm. There's more things that you can do in there. There's a uh, there's a little a little dummy you can activate that shoots back at oh, you too. Oh, the dummy. And. Uh, there's just a lot of enhancements and quality of life things. Salmon Run has their own practice room, too. I don't uh -huh. know if you did any oh, Salmon yet. Oh, that's right. I remember that now. Right. It's just off to the corner here, and your weapon equips. Like, yeah. once you, you know, hop over to the other side. And yeah. I, you're right. It's quality of life improvements. There are absolute game changers coming from a Splatoon to mm -hmm. meta and community over to Splatoon 3. Yeah. And I think the best part, too, is, you know, I was playing a few games while watching the stream here. And uh, I would be I would be watching what was going on while I'm just kind of waiting for my match to start, and then having the controller just like rumble. Okay, everyone's here. Time to go. You know, it's like, oh yeah, okay. Oh now yeah, I can, the now rumble. I, can play. I just realized about that. I forgot yeah. about that part. It's, oh, that's cool. It, yeah, it's such a good cue to have in the game. Right, but, exactly. I yeah. think overall the quality of life improvements have also again the experience that the player gets to have. It's just so much stronger, and it makes you want to come back to it. Because right. It's just easier. Yeah. And it encourages, uh, I feel like it encourages the competitive side of things, having it like an Anarchy Open series mm -hmm. too. And later on, we will get to have a more formal league, uh, a league mode that happens, and then X rank after that, mm -hmm. which I'm really excited for. But I know there's going to be uh, a lot of work for me to do, and for a lot of work for everybody to do now that we are going back to uh, the roots and being at B minus. Right, exactly. It's all about the adapting. Man, I'm getting my the floor wiped out of me in B minus right yeah. I never thought I'd live to see the day. It's, yeah. I'm probably running into, you know, top 500 JP players and never knowing it. <laughs> it's just we're on a full right. reset here, which is yeah. incredibly crazy to think about because we haven't seen that in years in yeah. this community. We really haven't. And a lot of people that I had talked to, they were debating on, well, should I – uh, should I start over? What should I do? Should I import my data? And I think the fact that we're like, oh, it's B minus. It's like, well, I want to have the weapons that I want to have in the game. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know going in that we were just going to have the base weapons too. But we right. we discovered that when we uh, could purchase weapons with the golden license. So kind of going back to the basics, but still in a way that doesn't make you have to do everything completely all over again. Mm -hmm. Now, talking about those licenses here, which ones did you use your licenses on and yeah, why? and why. That's because a, okay. that's that's something that players yeah. kind of have to decide here at Riptide. Yeah. I think players not at Riptide or competing that's, right now yeah. have kind of a little bit of a luxury and flexibility to kind of yeah. pick and choose what they want to actually use their licenses on rather than what's actually happening in the moment. You know, that's a really good point because – before I answer that, okay. that, that is a really good point because a lot of these players – 
they have to just go in and play these land matches. Again, you can't grind up and, oh, I, w I know I'll get this eventually and I want it. It's like, no, you need this weapon now if you want to do well in this tournament. So you're right. The stakes are just so much higher for the players who are here at the LAN. But I use mine on the end zap. Uh, of course, you a know, staple. A staple. You know, I, I play Junior in Splatoon 2 and I want to continue the support. And with just how strong Tacticooler is, it was, it was an easy choice for me. And then uh, since I play K-Shot, I chose the uh, just the splatter shot, you know, uh, getting <laughs> getting kind of a similar a similar kit that is um, accustomed to the Kenzo splatter shot. And then one that I chose, I haven't really played it yet, was the Exposure. Just, oh, that's an interesting pick. Just because it has um, it has like it has point sensor and rain, so just very easy chip damage. And again, it's not a weapon I play in particular, but I'm like, oh, sure. I you know I kind of like this kit. Yeah, allows you to try something completely new because yeah. I mean, with these web brand new game comes new weapon kits. We have we're seeing weapons with different kit combinations we haven't seen before, mm -hmm. not just from Splatoon two, but also from Splatoon one even. Yeah. So uh, that's a valid pick, though. Yeah. I don't blame you for that. Now, which three weapons did you choose? Let's see here. I think I first chose it on the Octobrush as someone who has been a big brush fan since Splatoon one that it has kind of come back, you know, mm -hmm. after playing the Splatfest. I think the Octobrush is going to be a game changer for a lot of folks, especially with the Zipcaster. Now, how do you like the Zipcaster? Because when I was looking at the weapons and the the um, ability or the subs and the specials, I'm like, man, this is so fun. Zipcaster brush, you're uh -huh. just Spider-Man. You know, you're just going back and forth, getting these amazing splats. How, how has it been working out? <sighs> P being Peter Parker for a moment, just those brief seven seconds when the specials activate him, perfection. But all seriousness, I think as a weapon, the kit complementing the Octobrush with the Zipcaster, mm -hmm. it just allows it to be a really great displacement tool. It yeah. allows you to reach certain spots that the Octobrush normally couldn't reach, even if you're running, you know, <laughs> guiding your brush along. Yeah. And, you know, you can't only go so far with that because otherwise you're going to get, you know, sniped down. Right. The blaster's going to come out and pop you. Yeah. I mean, there's only so much that you could do just with the brush and its range. However, the mobility that this Zipcaster allows you have, to be, you have to be so considerate of where you pop it yes. because of where you land yeah. and what you're going to do with it. You have seven seconds to make the most out of it, and mm -hmm. it can be fairly punishing even. Yeah. So I think it's just a very complex and exciting special to try out. Yeah, I mean, I, that's what I was hoping for. It's I'm very bad at it. You know, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to use it and I'm like hitting walls that I'm not like sticking to. I'm like, right. wait, what button, what button do I use? And then before I know it, I jump back to the place where I improperly like uh -huh. used it from. And I'm like, oh, okay. I just got spotted, I guess. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's, it's a weapon I want to get better at. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of people want to feel that way too, because just like with all these new weapon kits, there's just so much to try and right. experiment. Right. And it's something as Cherry Lime does, labbing it and trying something completely new just for the sake of uniqueness and just variety. Yeah. I think just, I mean, just the example for the Octobrush, we might be seeing maybe underrated weapons from Splatoon 2 become maybe not overrated but yeah. much more common and much more frequent than we often see them. You know, I've seen the I've seen the mini splatling more today Ooh. than I have really in competitive Splatoon 2. Um, I can't think off the top of my head what sub and special it had attached to it, but mm -hmm. I know most of the most of the players uh, who we faced uh, were using it and, and doing a very good job. But uh, what other two weapons did you choose? Let's see. I think I chose an only but the goodie, the splatter shot pro. Ooh, I think that okay. combo with the crab tank is absolutely delicious. I yeah. genuinely think it's going to be a really strong weapon if utilized correctly. Yeah. Now, crab ray or the crab yeah, ray. Crab ray. Hold crab on. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Love Crab Rave. Um, actually, one of the uh, one of the members from the last team uh -huh. or the last team is from Crab Rave, So hello, Crab Rave. Um, but the uh, the cr yeah the Crab Tank. I mean, it's it feel it's like a fun special that kind of feels like Inkjet, but just on the ground. <laughs> I yeah. guess I don't know how to describe it. It's a I could I I guess so. That's yeah. a good, that's one way of putting it. Especially yeah. I think well you also have the different I guess shot fires. Yeah, you yeah. have the blast radius. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you were to just have one explosion. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to pause right here because it looks like we're just about getting ready here. Uh, there's been a couple of tech delays during during the land this this weekend, just starting off day one. Mm -hmm. um, but it looks like players are just about getting ready here. 
Yeah, and I mean, it's kind of nice that, I, well, it's better that it's happening today for our side event of Splatoon 3. You know, again, we're still having another stream tomorrow that we're going we're going all the way back to Splatoon 2, um, <laughs> the game the game that we know and love. So, again, another shout out to all of our tech people in IPL who are making all these things possible. Right, imagine coming to Splatoon 3 one day, the next day reverting back to Splatoon yeah. 2 just one more time. Oh man, that's got some mixed feelings right there. <laughs> you know, it's it's a good feeling, I think, because a lot of the teams here, they were formed from playing Splatoon that 2. That is fair. Mm -hmm. So it's it's fun because this kind of feels like a, um, it, it's a new game. It, it's just different enough that something feels slightly different. And of course, the more we get used to Splatoon 3, we're going to be more comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. But um, it's it's kind of a, a, a farewell to competitive yeah. Splatoon 2. Uh, especially with the lands moving forward, well, probably I don't think they'll have a Splatoon 2, or maybe they'll have a side event, or you know something like that. But um, as we see a lot of players making the move from Splatoon 2 to Splatoon 3, right? A farewell is actually a good way to put it. I didn't think of it like that for a second there, because just I think so many people are just so enthusiastic for a new entry into this series and for something fresh, mm -hmm. pun intended, and new and innovative that I, I think a lot of people have kind of also, not forgotten, but just kind of put aside that Splatoon 2 had done so much to this community already. Yeah. I think it's just, yeah, it's a nice way to say farewell to a game that, you know, we're, we've grown so much from yeah. and we're ready to kind of jump into, spot jump into Splatoon 3. Yeah, exactly. And hey, we see some teams getting ready right here. Um, Again, moving starting with our first match, Claim Blitz on Mince Meat Metalworks. Uh, one of the one of the new stages in the game, and um, like you said, it is a uh, it is more narrow than a lot of the stages that we had seen before, uh, but still kind of feeling condensed. Right, exactly. Um, I mean, go, circling back to another point earlier, the different map layouts, I, I saw a fantastic art of this on Twitter. It seems like there is more pathways, like specific straight pathways in Splatoon 3. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. Splatoon 2, right, everything just right. kind of seems like mess. Yeah. You can kind of go anywhere, yeah. and you can just, just start something from anywhere. Yeah. So I think this will allow kind of different different strategies and maybe more succinct strategies to play out, I think, going forward. All right, and let's get started with our second set of this pool. Uh, let's take a look at the comps of these teams. Ah, I like the tent pick. I've heard some people, uh, two tent picks on both sides, on both EB Nigiri and uh, Last Ditch Effort. And uh, it looks like, uh, yeah, we are going to see the splatter shot too. I think with the uh, the the burst bomb and the crab, that, that's going to be a popular one as we move forward into Splatoon 3. And again, Tri Slasher has been very uh, very popular as well. Right, exactly. Uh, th these tent pushes are actually going to be incredibly interesting to utilize. I can already see the combos and people screaming soda out in the audience when the tactical were activated <laughs> there that was cute i love it we're not even uh we're not even 12 24 hours into splatoon 3 and we already have our uh we already have our <laughs> we do have our memes that we're saying on stream yeah i think the umbrella with this stage with the greats is really where you're going to capitalize on some of these pushes to push forward but look at this last ditch effort doing a good job getting some picks three players down right now as they're going to try and get some claims they have no claim right now but again you only need eight in this game and it looks like uh, Dude Lens is going to be getting the first power claim of the game as they're trying to take it up but no going to get splatted and now oh <laughs> wow what a momentum shift right there I mean you just saw like there was already a Danmo ready with a special you saw the clams ready to go and all of a sudden just a complete 180 and now we see EB Nagiri back in, back into the game and back, ready taking right uh, right of control in the middle yeah, Nigi uh, Nigiri not letting go of any of their uh, any of their loss at all. Uh, they are going to get a pick down on Last Ditch Effort as they're trying to push forward too. Getting that Clam Kami has 12 right now, 13, 14 Clams. There are there were two players that had six or more Clams, but unfortunately the one player who had a Power Claim is going to go down, and now uh, now Last Ditch Effort doing a good job holding them off. We see a jump out here by Riley after activating that special, probably to just stall uh, last dish effort a little bit longer, allowing them their teammates to come back in together. And now you see we're kind of right back from where we started, 4v4 in the middle of the stage, and it's been almost two and a half minutes. 
That's right. And it's just a stalemate of... We've seen this a lot in Clay and Blitz so far today, and we've seen it during uh, the Epic Tourneys earlier this week. Ooh, and that's going to be a really nice shot that's going to go down. And uh, Nigiri now pushing forward once again, uh, trying to form the power claim. It looks like they are going to have it right behind the crab. Are they going to take down the crab? But it looks like the power claim is not going to go in quite yet. Trying to get some splats, but it's just going to be the Luna Blaster who's alive. Right. Wow. What great template there, allowing to displace the crab tank there just long enough, but they just couldn't take advantage of that opportunity there just from all the chaos and the ink splattering everywhere. And right now we are less than, uh, we have less than half the time remaining in this game. Still no points being awarded yet. Just shows how competitive this game is. Last Ditch Effort now very close to two power claims. They have 14 total, two players with seven claims getting some picks. This is going to be a great opportunity as it looks like the Ink Back trying to get a shot, charging it up, but no, not going to take down the Brella. Um, but this might be a... Uh, this might be serving as a distraction, perhaps, as they try and push forward this power camp. This is the longest 1v1 that I think we have seen so far today. I mean, 10 is just, both 10s are doing their job. They're distracting each other, which allows their teammates to go do other productive things. I think it worked a bit too well on both sides, because now it seems like the game is just back at a stalemate. Players are down on each side, and we have a minute 30 left, Falco, and nothing has happened. Yeah, but look at this push from Last Ditch Effort. Once again, two power claims using the Brella to push along these grades, getting a pick, using the Ink back to suck up and charge a shot potentially. This is looking good for Last Ditch Effort as they're going to try and go up there. We're going to get one power claim in, we're going to get two power claims in, and able to maybe follow up with a few more. We shall see what happens. Right. That, I love, again, the tent push is just a fantastic way of allowing the teammates to get through the grates because that's such a strong chokehold defensively. It's so it's just so difficult to break through. Now, uh, here's, here's Nigiri's chance to try and counter this. They're going to need just a little more than two power clams. They do have the player advantage and they do have a claim economy, but one of their players are now going to go down as they're trying to find a way to break into this r defensive, uh, defensive, defensive position from Last Ditch Effort. Last Ditch Effort doing a really good job. Right, it looks like um, they were a little bit indecisive on what path and route to take. It looks like they were trying to do a two-pronged kind of pincer into mid right there, but it just didn't quite pan out, I think, the way that they wanted to. So now, 20 seconds left with Last Dish Effort in the lead here, and even Nigiri's going to have to act quickly here. Yeah, Nigiri trying to push forward using some of their specials. Ooh, but the uh, but the roller from Last Ditch Effort doing a good job. That power clam is not going to go in, going to get very close, and that's going to be tricky having three players down. I don't know if they're going to have enough time to get to that power clam. They Oh, and that is going to be game. I was a little bit afraid that this match was going to be like the one that occurred at PAX uh, the past weekend where it just went on for five straight minutes and, the play and nothing happened until overtime. I think the match was almost six minutes long. Yeah, there have been so many competitive clan blitz matches today. Like you mentioned, the one at PAX that win no score going into overtime. Those are exciting clan blitz right. games. They're very stressful for the players, but as as a spectator, as a fan, they're exciting because you know you just got to get one power clam in to win the game. Mm -hmm. But I think I, I like that change in Splatoon 3. They've just been so competitive. Mm -hmm. I think as a viewer, it's definitely very exciting. But as a player now who's trying to actually conduct these plays and mm -hmm. these strategies, I think both teams utilizing 10th there was a specific reaction to what's happened at PAX this past weekend. I think because 10 is such a great weapon for clams as someone who's played with a player who just one tricks this weapon and knows how to utilize it on this uh, specific mode. I think it was a great reaction to what's happened at PAX and a great way to kind of respond to that strategy and fix something that, you know, didn't work in the past. Yeah, like what's a weapon that I can use to help get this push across. And I mean, the Tent Umbrella, it's literally the same width as the Greats, too. Literally, like, it was that wide. Yeah. <laughs> so it makes it it makes it that much better. And, um, you know, that's something that I feel like we're going to be seeing in the uh, in the fourth pool uh, that happens later today. Or now, now I wish I want to trade in my Explo for the for the Tent Umbrella. Can I do that? Is that possible? Oh, I wish. <laughs> I don't think that's <laughs> what, how that works. What's Falco? Sheldon's ref refund uh, policy? <laughs> 
you know? I think you need a receipt, don't you? You need a receipt, okay. You need a receipt, yeah. uh, your your credit card that you used to pay for it, yeah. right? The you whole need, nine you yards. Need all, you need all that, okay. Yeah. I'll, you know, I guess I'll have to uh, grind up to it and use some tickets and whatever level it is. I'll, again, a lot of these players are... I would say no greater than level like seven or eight. I, I don't know. I'm just kind of making up a number. Um, but they're lower than what you guys are at home who have been playing Splatoon 3 uh, or higher if you've stayed up all night uh, just playing the game. Oh, yeah, man. The, the kids, man. I don't know how you kids do it playing all yeah. night. We're too old for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's 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 one of those things. You do this once a year. Right. Uh, you're here to be with your friends. If your friends are if your friends are staying up doing it, it's, it's so fun to play like the anarchy open series with your friends and i know we're, we're gonna be saying that a lot but just it's it's just it's a good feeling it's it a re it's a refreshing change in this new game it is and just seeing people again after so long i know i got to see my friends from purdue again that was such a joyous thing as someone who's just recently graduated college and you know missing friends from from college yeah. you know the community that i've helped grow build and cherish yeah we get to see you know get to see them again but anyways Splatoon action, let's get it. Yeah, let's move on to our second match today uh, during the set. This is going to be Splat Zones on Mahi Mahi Resort. Ah, uh, we see the Stringer here on this on in the blue team on the side of LDE. So that's a very fun pick and something that players are going to have to kind of adapt to as a brand new weapon. That's right. This is one of my teammates' favorite weapons that they're getting. They wanted all of the blasters, and they got the Luna Blaster. They're having, a, they're having fun. But with that, three players are going to go down pretty quickly in the last such effort as Nigiri is getting the first cap. And uh, again, a different change of pace from what we saw already. Um, they're able to put points on the board. Right, exactly. And LDE already two down. Those desynced respawns are going to matter because now this allows even Nigiri to push in. They're launching the missiles here. Not the missiles, excuse me, the ink strikes here and just trying to hold them back. Yeah, but it's not quite working just yet. They are going to get in the zone using that killer whale too to try and displace and locate some of these players. But Nigiri doing a good job. Oh, and that's going to be the first cap for LDE, giving 49 penalty due points to Nigiri. Right, exactly. This momentum shift was a great play made possible by the killer whale initiating that opening for LDE to come back in and claim the zone. And Nigiri trying to break back in, but last ditch effort doing a great job holding on to this zone. We, here's a new weapon we see the bow, uh, the bow weapon that has the killer whale. Um, now, have you got to play this weapon yet? I have not. I, I only played it once during the Splatfest because I was just so distracted by the other, other all the other weapons in their brand new kits. Uh, that might be similar experiences to a lot of folks here playing today. They're just experiencing these brand new weapons with own, with completely new styles and techniques here that's adapting to a brand new environment again. And Nigiri preventing the lead change, getting that cap just in time, giving 48 penalty points to LDE. We see the crab there trying to get some paint, trying to move some players. Uh, now two players are going to go down on Nigiri as Last Ditch Effort still holding onto the zone and three players down. This is going to give them an opportunity to push up. The last player from Nigiri is now going to be jumping out and LDE taking control of every area around the zone too. Those past 20 seconds that LDE and Ibinigiri were fighting for the zone, painting as if their lives depended on it, were so crucial because, again, that determines the momentum and the initiation of these pushes. And it paid off for LDE to get that back and knock down some penalty. But then right as I say that, Ibinigiri takes back the zone and we're back to square one. We are. Three players are going to go down, and the Luna Blaster has the Zip Caster ready, looking forward to seeing what they can do. And it looks like they are going to be using it to push forward. What a wonderful opportunity trying to get one of these picks, and they are going to get a player down, now going to be jumping back. And that is exactly what you need to do with the Zip Caster. Exactly. That was a great play. A little risky, though. They were caught in a little bit of a surprise in that 1v1 when they thought they would have the advantage. So that was a, a good, that was a close call by Ibn Nagiri there. And now two players are down on Ibi Nigiri as a last ditch effort, able to take the zone once again. They do have a lot of penalty points they need to get through in order to try and take the lead, but they're doing a good job. These teams are really going back and forth, trading uh, who has a zone, especially during these lockout phases. Right, exactly. I mean, this, the coordination of these specials that allows them to take back these zones here have been incredibly well played, which is why this game has been so close. It's just been a constant back and forth of who can do this better. And two on two with just under, just over a minute and a half <gasps> remaining. Ooh, oh. that was a, that was a jump out. I didn't think that was going to happen. 
Wow, that was an incredible close call. I'm, I might have just blasted my mic there. I am so sorry, easy viewers. <laughs> I thought they had a special that was like, you touch the water, you go back. But no, that was an actual jump back to spawn. Very impressive. Uh, now three players are going to be down, and that's going to help LDE try and get the lead here as they are still trying to dwindle some of these penalty points. Uh, now Raman trying to go and look on the side, seeing where some of these members are coming from. And uh, But no, this is going to be potentially a cat by Ibi Nigiri. Let's see if they can pull it off in this last minute. Oh, this uh, Inzuku, Inzuku here just came in at the right time, at the right moment as the pressure from LDE was coming through. I think that Inzuka just helped them secure the zone again. But as I say that, two go down on the side of Ibi Nigiri, and the momentum has shifted once again. The penalty points are starting to dwindle down. Look at this last ditch effort trying to capitalize on this with 30 seconds remaining. Ibi Nigiri trying to find an opportunity to break in, and they're running out of time if they want to keep this lead. The a triple ink strike doesn't isn't going to be detonated, and with that, last ditch effort going to be taking the lead. Wow, and that was such a crucial moment for Ibi Nigiri to come back in together. But with the slosher dying right as they're trying to pull together a push onto the zone, it's a complete momentum shift. But they're able to recover somehow, and now we're back to square one. Ibi Nigiri with control of the zone looking to tack, tack off those penalty points. What I really like about both of these teams is when they know they are very close to taking the lead, they just go all in and do everything they possibly need. And this is what uh, Last Touch Effort needs to do if they want to hold on and get the win. And it looks like they are able to pull it off. What an incredible example of composure right there from Ibi Nigiri. Being on the, I feel like they were on the back end for a good chunk of that game. I understand that that game was incredibly close in terms of score. But it felt like Ibi Nigiri each time was having to fight and push back onto the zone every single time. So I think that was just a great example of composure and staying calm and collected by Ibi Nigiri there. Absolutely. And with Splat Zones and Clan Blitz being a very different style of game, we saw a very conservative gameplay in Game 1 and a very aggressive game gameplay in Game 2. With uh, Now we're going to a Game 3 in this set too, which makes it all that more exciting. Right, because Ibi Nigiri is fighting to stay alive in the set because, again, this is best of three. So the stakes are definitely higher. And in comms, that is something in this land experience where you can kind of feel the tension mm -hmm. off of each other. It's an incredibly interesting dynamic. So the fact that Ibi Nigiri was able to pull that win off and in a clutch factor in clutch factor fashion honestly I it's gonna be a great set and the game three I cannot tell you right now who's gonna win it genuinely I that's kind of a terrible answer to give but I mean genuinely I have no clue yeah and I mean you guys can see that as well at home with just how competitive these players are and we will be moving on to tower control Wahoo world so again going back to a map and mode that we know in Splatoon 2 some may love some may not I'm a big fan personally a big fan. I'm a Wahoo world fan yeah you know I, I agree I think it's a very unique map combo uh, for tower control that's something we do not see right. in Splatoon tune to competitive yeah um, whenever tournaments often pull together Wahoo world I think we typically see Wahoo zones mm -hmm. so it's definitely something new for players a little bit unfamiliar with you know the comp fashion trend that they're used to to all of a sudden go to TC instead of zones yeah and I, th I believe the map itself is identical to what it is in Splatoon 2 or ish I haven't experimented with it too much the only thing that I can re recall at this moment is unfortunately the the tower control path itself yes, that yeah, does deviate yeah. that does deviate but i think the core facets of wahoo world as a stage will remain the same and as we get into this game let's take a look and see what what they've changed and it looks like we are sticking with the uh the luna blaster on the side of uh ibi nigiri and um we do see the nozzle nose on the last touch ever. Did we see that in the previous I was game? just about to point that out. I don't think we did, um, unless my memory just completely just served me wrong here. But as you can see here, the tower path is slightly different here from Splatoon. It's coming off of the side here instead of coming. It, it has a, it's going off of the, of the ledge slightly differently than it was in the previous game. That's right. And now Ibi Nagiri going to be taking the first tower ride, getting three players down on last ditch effort, approaching this first checkpoint. It, this is this is a really good position for Ibi Nagiri. If they can breeze past this first checkpoint, which they do, this is going to set them up for success. Right. They have several members trapped here and Fishy getting a great kill on the Luna here and slowly making their way forward into kind of the drop down area of LDE. And we see the Zipcaster on top of that. That's just immense pressure. That, and the, now the end zap is down. No tactic cooler on the side of LDE. 
That's right, and then look at that, getting all the way past and breezing through that second checkpoint. Ibi Nagiri making this look easy, but not without three of their players going down, as this is going to be an opportunity for last ditch effort to try and push in and get some more mid, get some map control, then win the 1v1s and potentially get on the tower. Right, this recovery stage is very crucial for setting the stone forward for when they want to initiate a push whether and gathering those specials ready to coordinate something succinct and effective. And with the combination of the Tacticaler and the Bubbler, that is a <laughs> that is a defensive field day right there as uh, the tower is now going to be taken by Ibi Nigiri. It's going to be let go just a little bit. Uh, we can see, oh, you know, that's a really nice, a really nice double there from Ibi Nigiri as they're going to be pushing up, trying to get some, trying to watch people as they drop in. And uh, they have the tower once again and are looking to extend their lead. Echo is on a roll right now, snagging three kills now, winning those one, those crucial 1v1s that allows Ibi Nigiri to push the tower again. There's a fourth one right there, is from what I could see on the spec camera. And once again, we're almost in the same exact spot as Ibi Nigiri was in their prior push. That's right, but look, three players are going to go down once again, so it's just right when they get to this 33 mark, it seems that Last Ditch Effort is able to find a stop. Now, this is going to be hard for El Last Ditch Effort because they need to control mid like they had before, and this is going to be <laughs> very helpful with the crab special that they can use and just look and make sure people aren't pushing from this right side, uh, especially, too, with the Tactical are now getting all of their um, ability, all their abilities enhanced as well, and uh, Last Ditch Effort getting on the board for the first time this game, just about three minutes in. Right, those three little points, they, they matter, unfortunately, but I think this is going to be this, hopefully the start of something that LDE wants. However, right as I mean, right as I say that, that all those wants are dashed away, and we see LDE once again getting some clutch picks and moving right back into the push that they started earlier. It's just a constant pressure point for LDE to deal with. Ibi Nagiri in a very good position because they know that if Last Ditch Effort needs, if they want to get on the tower, they're going to need to make a fantastic push at this point. But look at that, three players are going to go down. Guess where we got to? 33. <laughs> it seems to be, uh, it seems to be just, just a struggle point. But this is, I think, the third time that we've kind of been in the situation. You're right. I think teams are going to constantly have trouble getting to that ne that checkpoint because it's at a, a crucial chokehold on the defensive end. It's probably the best point where a defensive team can hold against their opponent. So I can see, absolutely see why each time they get stuck at 33. And now Lasich are trying to extend their push just a little bit, but a few players once again going to be going down. I mean, even Nagiri, they're They've turned it up with their defense on this game compared to games one and two. Um, I think the more aggressive play style that tower control can favor as well uh, may may suit them a little better. But uh, they're, I mean, they're just in such good position. Right. I mean, a lot of them are. A lot of the players are actually working really well together. Ab Nagiri's players, they are coordinating exactly where they're going to attack. Like, they just attacked that uh, ramp that just extended, put some pressure, then retracted together. So there's just some great examples of teamwork that Ibi Nigiri has been displaying here that I think LDE is kind of struggling with. That's right. And, uh, Killer Whale being used on this stage, I like that in particular because there are there are very narrow paths uh, if you're like if you're below the uh, rotating platform to try and get some uh, try and get some picks. But look, I, Last Ditch Effort trying to push again once more to take the lead, but they just can't quite get the hang of it to get the lead. And look, three players are going to go down, and Ibi Nigiri looks like they're going to be walking into a victory on this one. Yeah, I mean, like you said earlier, Ibi Nigiri just turned it up. I think they were playing at like that peak crucial like flow state. I don't know if you're yeah. not familiar with the term, but it's like that moment where you are just so in the zone and so in tune to what's happening. Like, I mean, just like, for an example, Tux made some fantastic plays with their Trizuka, yeah. targeting down the specific chokehold points yeah. where they would know that um, that LDE would be standing when they're right. trying to, to, you know, stop stop the tower from progressing. Yeah, and I mean, especially on a mode like tower control where you can't control where the objective is, you know you need to be in a good position and get the splats at that very point. Right, exactly. I mean, just overall, that there was just, they turned it up. I think part of that was also playing from the momentum that they had from game two. Right. Narrowly squeaking by, having that clutch factor moment and realizing, hey, we got this. Yeah. We're fine. Let's just do our thing and get in there 
and win it. Yeah. So with that, Evie Nigiri getting the win over last ditch effort, and um, I guess it's technically reverse sweep uh, with the best of three. Technically. Technically. Te uh, <laughs> you know. What? I mean, fair enough. I guess. <laughs> technically, you know, it just makes it sound uh, very cool. You know. Yeah, like yeah. something actually happened in yeah. like a you know yeah. best of three set. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, actually.